Yes. Uh, I got a okay, go ahead. Ask it over here. Uh, yeah. You need the exercise. On the on the jury part of it, uh, in retrospect, uh, when the my, my understanding is when they select a jury, they meaning the attorneys and what have mm -hmm. you, they ask only a couple of questions if they're a uh, citizen of the United States and those type of questions sure. to become a juror. So, uh, as if you're one of the people being tried on a 12 juror, then you're being tried not of your own peers, but of another jurisdiction. So how would that apply to one of the people? Well, I have, I have no guaranteed answer on that, but there was a story I heard about 10 years ago or so where this guy in San Diego insisted on a jury of peers. Now, what's a, what's a peer? A peer is a, member who's a, uh, is a member of the peerage. So what's the peerage? Well, that's the nobility. That's the sovereignty. We were all sovereigns in the United States. We were all automatically promoted to the peerage. So the true meaning of the word peer is a member of the peerage, a fellow sovereign. When they created this new class of human being in 1868 with the 14th Amendment called citizen of the United States, we now have a two-level caste system. We have the people of the United States who own the country, who own the United States, and then we have the citizens of the United States who are owned by the United States. Okay? So, we have that system. Well, this guy insisted on a jury of his peers. Well, they couldn't find anybody who would not admit that he was not a citizen of the United States. And so, the judge ordered the sheriff to go out and find some peers. And he, you know, of course, he didn't know where to look. He didn't know to come to one a group like this. And, and so he had to report back to the sheriff or to the judge that he couldn't find any peers. They had to dismiss the case because they couldn't satisfy the demand for a jury trial. A jury of peers. I, I'd never tracked down that case. I would have loved to. But I'd heard that, that story. So that was in San Diego, is what I heard. I wouldn't advise trying it. Well, you wouldn't advise trying it, you say, but uh, why not? I don't know. Just, you know you there's want. Other ways. There's other ways. What other ways? I mean, you know, well, you can put on a seminar. Tell us. But, you know, the thing is, the thing is, is that, well, you know, there's, there's many different ways to, to skin a polecat, as the saying goes. And uh, so that, that's just. You pick your strategy and you you fight it out. All right, so um, going back to the foundation here. All right, so the question is, are you a people or a citizen? And is everybody at this point clear on this point of what the difference is between people and citizens? Do you understand that a citizen is under the jurisdiction a people is over the jurisdiction. Okay? That's right, too. Well, there's levels of jurisdiction, so if the people own the country and the country owns the citizen, then, you know, the, the country has jurisdiction over the citizens. So, okay. Now we, and then we covered um, a little bit about sovereignty. Let's go back to the sovereignty because there's more case law that you can look to. For example, here in California, now those of you from other states, look, the concept is solid. The people created the entity. And when they created the entity, they released none of their sovereignty. It was a creation, okay, or it was an ordination. So that, that's where your, your primary um, definition is of the relationship between people and government. But, Sometimes, like in California, it's legislatively defined as well. Now, here in California, we have what's called the government code. 
And the government code basically is a set of instructions from the legislature to the, the uh, uh, public employees explaining to them what the government is all about. <clears throat> and I believe it's section 100, I think that's the section of the government code, that says that the sovereignty of the state lies in the people. This, the sovereignty has no, it doesn't exist in the state itself. It has no absolute sovereignty. They can claim sovereign immunity, that's true, but only to the citizens. They're immune from the, the efforts of the citizens. But they're not immune to other sovereignties that are higher than them. For example, they're not immune to a Title 42, Section 1983 lawsuit based on violations of civil rights. Okay, the federal laws, you can walk right in. You don't have to make a prior claim to the government. You can sue them directly because they are outside of or actually under the federal sovereignty on those particular issues. And that's constitutionally defined that the federal law is the higher law. So, um, they, the, when you're sovereign, you're above the state also. The state's not sovereign. It's an agency. An agent of the sovereign. So you can sue them, and they cannot claim any statutory protections. You go back to the basic laws of common law. Now, why common law? Well, the reason is this. You see, as a sovereign, if you're truly sovereign, you can make up any fiction you want. You can make up any kind of rule system. The common law is just one way of doing things. There's other ways you can do things too. Other ways you can specify rules. So, what you do, you go to the common law for one simple reason. If you look at the constitutions, or it's particularly the Constitution of the United States, the common law is recognized by the United States and will be enforced for you. If you have an issue that arises under the Constitution, you can then use the common law to enforce it. Because the Constitution says the judicial power of the United States shall apply to all cases in law and equity that arise under the Constitution. Okay? That's why we want the common law. If we fit into the common law mold in our private law, they will back you with their judicial power. So, that's what we do. But, <clears throat> in California, we have the government code, and government code section 11120, more commonly known as the bagley Keene Act, is basically, its, its main focus is the um, conducting of public meetings among the public agencies. Okay? So they're not supposed to have private meetings except certain very narrowly defined exceptions. But they do have something here that's really neat. And I use it frequently. And what it is, is it says the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Yes. Washington You got it there too. In Washington? 4217. Alright. Go ahead. Put on the record. Here. Okay. It, it, it's also in uh, Washington State. Uh, RCW is under uh, 4217251, which is our public disclosure laws. And it says that we have to, they, the government has to keep us informed just mm -hmm. as this does. Right, but so the, real, the real point is, is that the people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Okay, the courts are an agency. Okay, they are, we, when, we, when we act through the courts, we are acting through our representatives. Okay, but since this is a republic, we can choose to act on our own. We can act directly. You open up our, uh, uh, so the people's sovereignty is definite and we do not yield it. 
Yeah. Went to the Orange County Law Library and looked on uh, Law Desk, and according to them, 54950 is still there, but 11120 was repealed. Oh, 11120 is repealed because it's still on the the um, the legislature. Leg info. Yeah, leg info. They they maintain a site, and it's still there. So I don't know when they appealed it or repealed it, but as far as I know, it's still there. And but five four nine five zero is still there, right? Okay. I kind of feel these two are sort of overlapping in what they did, but it says the exact same thing, word for word, identical. The people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. So they've got a case going to you, and you walk in, you say you're one of the people. And when you do your counterclaim, there you have the exact way they have overrun your sovereignty. You see how they exceeded their jurisdiction. There is absolutely no authority anywhere that I've been able to find that authorizes them to prosecute people. They can prosecute persons, but not people. Okay? Now, of course, there's always the fight to get that enforced, but still, that is the black and white letter of, of the, of the co encoded law. That's known as the Ralph M. Brown Act. I'll check out that 111.20 uh, and see if it has been repealed. And anybody listening to the DVD should check it out, too make sure. That's another thing. The rules do change. So whenever you do a case, and I know this is hard to do, but you should always take, if at all possible, a fresh check on the status of things. No point in quoting something that doesn't exist anymore. But thanks. Okay. All right, so that, that's that part. Let's see. <clears throat> Black's Law Dictionary define sovereignty. The power to do everything in a state without accountability. In other words, there's no higher law. It's to make laws, to execute and to apply them, to impose and collect taxes and levy contributions, to make war or peace, to form treaties of alliance or of commerce and w with foreign nations and the like. Okay? That is not the law. That isn't even a dictionary definition. It, it, it actually comes from Story's uh, constitutions, whoever Story was. He was a writer, legal writer. And he, I guess he wrote a book on the Constitution. It was section 207. You can look it up there. So he's a highly respected source. Okay, Sovereignty in government is that public authority, which, notice that, sovereignty in government. All right. Again, the real sovereignty is in the people. But, if you have sovereignty in government, it means sovereignty only in those areas where it has been granted permission to act. Okay? To that extent, they have sovereignty, but they cannot go beyond it. If they go beyond their limits, they're eligible for a lawsuit. Okay? So, it's sovereignty in government is that public authority which directs or orders what is to be done by each member associated in relation to the end of the association. Each member, that's, what you, that's another code phrase for citizen. People are not members of the government. We own the government. I think there's another word they're using in government these days. I haven't, I haven't locked into it yet, but the, the word they use now is stakeholders. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill, you're quoting the fourth edition. How about the uh, more current editions? Uh, do they change the def definition of sovereignty? No, they can't change the definition because sovereignty at the time that the Constitution was formed had whatever meaning it had. They can't change that. So they, might be, able, that the they might be able to fool you into thinking it's changed. Okay. Now, was the more current editions don't define it this way, though, do they? Um... Well, I don't know. I can't say that for sure, but I think, um, let's put it this way, the, just because a dictionary is published at a later date 
does not necessarily mean that the original definition is invalidated. Okay? As was pointed out earlier, um, Judge Justice uh, Scalia goes to original intent. He goes to the original meaning of the words to understand what was meant back then. And the same still holds in any endeavor of law where you're trying to apply precedent. Whether you use an old meaning or a current meaning, well, let me say this. Who's the tribunal in your court? Okay, so you're the ultimate judge. Yes. Go ahead, microphone. Yeah, that's yeah. That turns out that that, that is a one-question microphone. <laughs> Stakeholders. What did you say about that? What is meant by well, that? Well, that's a new word that's popping up in government now. I'm not sure what it means. I'm not even sure it has a legal meaning. I noticed that, and I would like to know more about it. So would I. I haven't seen it. I've seen, heard it used, but I haven't heard it used in an authoritative method where I can track down and say this is exactly what it means. I haven't found that yet. But it's from the mining claims I've been told here. But I don't know. Okay, something. Yes. Or it could come from the Inquisition when they threatened them with uh, stakes and racks. Sure, it could be. So you're a stakeholder. <laughs> and then you would be a stakeholder. <laughs> or it may be. It may be that the top guy decided to use it. Spends a lot of time at the barbecue in his backyard. I don't know. But but the thing is, is. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. You know, if I were punished for every pun I said, I'd need a puny shed in which to hide my punished head. <laughs> okay, well, anyhow, yeah, but I, it's, I'm just giving you a heads up. This is a new word that they're now using, including, I don't know what it means. Same way, another <laughs> word that popped up a few decades back, and I haven't seen a solid definition, is the word regional. What's a region? I see it around, but I don't know what it is. Yes. Um, Bill, um, in the definition of sovereignty, the first line, the power to do everything in a state without accountability. Right. I, I don't understand that. Without being accountable for anything? That's right. So you could murder someone? They do. It's called war. Definitely. It's called war. It's called putting down an insurrection. Well, I know I've heard you say, you know, that... In common law, you're not supposed to injure anyone. So Well, that's right, but common law is not the same as statutory law. Sovereignty means there's nothing higher. Okay? Nothing higher, so okay. So if you do, in fact, have sovereignty in government, mm -hmm. then you can do anything you want. Stakeholder, first point, the word stakeholder. Second point, mining claim. Okay? Third <coughs> point, mine. <laughs> Fourth point, it's mine to own. Therefore, the people own the U.S. That, that's the uh, chain of logic he has. Well, could be. But you see, okay, so you're saying it comes from the mining industry, the stakeholder phrase. Okay, great. <coughs> all right, but look at this. You, you see here we have definition of citizens, all right? Now, whenever you're talking about the definition of the word, it's always good to ask who's the final authority on that definition. Now, if you follow the statutory system, the final authority would be the courts. Or, if it gets appealed, the appellate court. Okay? That's the final authority. If you are running your court, you're the sovereign of your court, then you're the final judge as to what a word means. You ever heard about having your name in all caps versus upper and lower case? Well, I know I, it happens that uh, when I put together my legal paperwork and I, you know, I type it up and I'm the plaintiff. And when I'm the plaintiff, I type it in sometimes all caps, sometimes upper and lower case, depending on my mood, okay? Now, who is the tribunal in my court? Right. So, that definition doesn't hold water in my kingdom. Okay? Or my court. That simple. It's really wonderful when you get the feeling of this. You know? Who's boss? And you have to have that clear definition. Are you the plaintiff? 
If you're the plaintiff, you're the boss. Don't ever let go of that. And if they try to do something, object when you're in the courtroom. And back that up with a court order. Okay? Now, speaking of backing it up with a court order, and I'll, I'll show you some examples later on. Understand this, that when you issue an order, they don't always obey it. Okay? So now you have to push it further. Now, how would you push it further? Well, probably a mandamus. You take it to a higher court, not higher than yours, but a higher court than their court. And you get the appellate court or the Supreme Court to order the judge of the Superior Court to toe the line. You see, look at it this way. If you had a company and you hired an employee and this employee came from an employment agency, he's a temporary employee in your company. So, you then direct this employee to do things. But what happens if he refuses? You can't really fire him because he doesn't work for you. You have a contract with this employment agency to provide a body and this body is not, not cooperating. So how would you handle that? Well, the, way, the proper way to handle it is you go back to the company you contracted with and you tell that company either make your employee straighten up or get me a new employee or else the contract's over. Right? Isn't that the logical three choices you got? Well, that's what you're doing with the state. When you hire the judge into your court, the state is the employment agency. So, rather than discipline the judge directly, which you could do with contempt of court proceedings, <coughs> rather than do that, you could complain to the employment agency called the state and the way you would do it is you would go to the appellate court. That's the, the uh, higher authority from the judge's point of view. Okay? You say, straighten this guy out. And, they, and, and the procedure that you follow would be called mandamus because you want them to mandate that he do something or not do something. Yeah. So, it, it, see, the mandamus, is, is that's an order not to be disobeyed. That's why it's called mandamus. Okay, I'm going. Yep. Yeah. I'm talking while you're going. So... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I found out uh, recently that uh, kicking your up, uh, what you were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, taking it up to the uh, attorney general's office, your uh, order, when you're giving it to the court. This is what I did, and getting getting it up to Ashcroft's office, for example, or the nominee, mm -hmm. and uh, telling them, did you order this? Uh, 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 authorization or whatever uh, author delegated right. authority and right. put it to question and you sent them the whole package registered mail right. that's under 28 federal code of civil procedure 509 pa pages 509 to 519 pages or sections pages okay that doesn't do us any good because pages change the sections are constant okay what sections is it uh, no, no section. It was just the pages. Federal rules. You have to have procedure. a section in there somewhere, or a rule number if it's the actual okay, if rule. There was I overlooked it, but it's. Uh, <clears throat> All right, we'll have to look on that. Which which year was it published so we can know what what to look in for that page? Don't have a year. It's just. Uh, okay. Well, it leaves us kind of a float in. Okay. All right, but here's the concept, so you can know to look for it. The idea is, the federal government has these rules, whatever they made up. The state can prosecute under those rules. But if the prosecution rises to the level of a felony, <clears throat> the federal government has said, before you can enforce any of our federal rules that are on a, fel on a felony level, you must get our permission first. Now, he's saying that's on page 509 of the... 519. <clears throat> and through 519? Correct. Okay, so it's about 10 pages worth that it's in there. So you get some copy, whatever that copy is, of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, look that up. Because if you've got a felony charge against you that in, invokes federal law, the state has to get permission first, according to what he's saying. That's correct. But let me make a further suggestion. 
uh, the, the feds are, are very, very much involved with state business. It used to be <clears throat> that the feds got their money from the states by going to popular taxation, by going to borrowing money from banks, paper money, you know, fiat money. By doing that, they've been able to loosen up their dependency on the state. And in fact, they've turned it around. Now, I think it's across the board, I forget what it is, 15% goes to the states. It's pre-allocated. I'm not sure of my number, but it, one way, one program or another, they make sure that each of the states get something like 15%. But whatever the percentage is, the states are now dependent on the federal government, which inverts the power flow. And, but here's the thing. That means they're getting federal funding, right? Whenever the state conducts a federal procedure, don't they get federal money to help cover the cost? And if they do, they must meet federal standards. So it might be that that rule that was just mentioned might just apply here. It doesn't apply to you, but it does apply to the state, and you may be able to hang the state on violation of that rule. So it's just a thought. Yes, sir. Now, uh, is this on? Yes. Okay. Uh, in doing a, a default judgment in the state, you don't uh, ex execute the um, damages on uh, through a mandamus, I imagine. Well, the de default judgments and stuff—that's a whole procedure that we're not. That's getting separate. Into. We're not getting into that today. Okay. But that uh, is a process, yeah. Okay. But basically, in summary, just to give you a, a hint on it, since it's brought up is a default judgment means the other person didn't answer within the time required. So now you say, well, okay, you subject them to whatever your proposed action was. You subject them and then, uh, and then you have to get a writ of execution which you deliver to the sheriff and the sheriff then goes out and enforces it. He has the gun. That's the theory. It's just a <laughs> quick overview. That's not complete. There's a lot of detail in there that I left out. But that's the idea. All right. Going down further, um, <clears throat> here's the, uh, here are the, the uh, preambles to the California Constitution. 1849 Constitution, we the people of California, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom in order to secure its blessings, do establish this Constitution. There's your relationship again. The people established it. Is there anything in the word established that means they gave up anything? Nothing. You're sovereign before, you're sovereign after. 1879, 30 years later, the, the citizens of the United States voted on the 1879 Constitution. So the 1879 Constitution was never accepted by Congress. And most states, from what I understand, have two constitutions. The real one, which was established them as a republic, and then the one that they're using to operate by, established by the U.S. citizens, and they just threw, by changing the educational system, they've bamboozled everybody to thinking that it's the real Constitution. But even it says, if you go along with the scam they've got going, even it says, we the people of the state of California, grateful Almighty God for our freedom, in order to secure and perpetuate this blessing, do establish this Constitution. The people are still sovereign. You know, the Ayatollah Khomeini was... was interested in establishing some form of government for, for uh, I guess, was it Iraq or Iran? Iran. Iran? Iran, right. And he eventually settled down. He chose a republic. Why? Well, it's very simple. The people of a republic are above the law of the government. They're not above the common law, but they're above the government law. Okay. So, the people who are citizens are subject to the government law because they are citizens of the governmental entity. So, a republic in one sense is the best form of government to have. In another sense, it's the absolute worst form of government. What makes the difference? The difference is the knowledge of the people. Because if you don't know you can be a people and you're absolutely convinced you're a citizen, then guess what? You'll be a citizen subject to it. But a Republican form of government is how the powers that be in the government can exempt themselves. They know they're exempt, 